cool in the morning and it's absolutely fabulous. Welcome Wanda, it's always good to have you and glad that you're healing well. Nice to see you again. The only announcement that I have is we did postpone our luncheon with Byron Wade uh, due to COVID and other things, but we are going to reschedule. Um, it will probably be uh, in early October, but we'll announce that we are going to have uh, whatever date that is convenient with him. Other than that, I don't have anything else. Did I miss anything? If not, let us worship God. Our call to worship is printed in your bulletin. Where two or three are gathered together, God, God is in their midst. Is. We gather to claim the promises, to we retell the stories, stories, to remember who we are as the people of God. Let yes. us worship God. Our hymn is number uh, 417 in the uh, blue hymnal. Amen. Our hymn is number 
300 in the red hymnal.
Our scripture this morning is from Matthew chapter 18, verses 15 through 20. Matthew chapter 18, 15 through 20. It's found on page 794 of the Bible in front of you. I would invite you to take that Bible out and follow along as I read. If another member of the church sins against you, go and point out the fault when the two of you are alone. If the member listens to you, you have regained that one. But if you are not listened to, take one or two others along with you so that every word you may confirm by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If the member refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if it offends, if the offender refuses to listen even to the church, let such a one be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly I tell you, <clears throat> whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly I tell you, if two of you agree on earth about anything you ask, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. May the Lord add rich blessing to the reading of the word, the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> Some years ago, I was in a church and we were discussing plans about building a building. <clears throat> I've done that actually several times in my ministry, and it's never the most pleasant time in the life of a church. <clears throat> I was in that uh, deep discussion of what it would look like, how many stalls would be in the bathroom, all of that stuff. And that summer, Wanda and I were going to take a car and meet our daughter halfway across the country. She was living in Seattle, and we were living in Clover, South Carolina, and Seattle, Washington. And uh, so as we started across country, we kept getting calls from Susan. Well, I can't make it that far. You'll have to come a little further. And so... We were making it further and further across the country. Well, I had noticed that the church of the Big Hole in Montana would let you stay in their manse if you preached in their church. And I thought, well, now that's an option for us. Uh, and so I lined it up. And a couple of weeks before we were to leave, I got this long letter with instructions. Now, it'll be hay gathering time in Montana. So you won't have many men, it'll be mostly women, they said. And you need to get up early and leave the manse in time to go the 75 miles down the road to the first church that you'll be preaching at. And then you will come back up the road to the church where you stayed at the manse and then go up the road another 75 miles to preach at the third church. And I thought, hmm, I didn't understand that the church of the big hole had three different chapels to it. But it did. So one and I got in the car went down to the first church and we were quickly informed by the musician, I don't play out of that blue thing. <laughs> she only wanted to use the red hymnal. I said, that's fine, we'll use the red hymnal. We got to the second point and the uh, young lady who came to play the keyboard said, all we have is uh, sing the faith the little supplement background. I said, that's fine, we can sing out of Sing the Faith. We got to the third point, which was 
by far the oldest church. It had been built in the 1800s uh, in a place called Wisdom, Montana. And we arrived and Wanda said, I need to go to the bathroom. I'm going to go to the bathroom. And she started around trying to get in the church. And I said, hmm, I think the bathroom's right there <laughs> out of the yard. She said, I'm not going there. So we got back in the car and went down to the local bar. Uh, and, uh, and we used the restroom and then came back to the church. Well, when we got back, there was a, a, an older fellow who was sitting on the front stoop of the church. And we came up and he said, I don't know whether we're having church today or not. And I said, well, I hope so because we didn't drive all the way from South Carolina not to have church. I'm supposed to preach. And he said, oh, oh, okay. About that time, we heard this little pop, 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 pop in a Volkswagen van that looked like it got lost in the 1960s, <laughs> came driving up to the church and a young couple got out. And the first words out of the gentleman's mouth was, to Wanda, do you play the piano? She said, she said, no, I do not. He said, well, I best go home and get my guitar. And, and uh, he did, and we heard it go back and come back. But the young lady stayed, and the older gentleman turned to her and said, what did y'all decide? And she said, well, it's mixed. There's, you know. He said, well, I just want you to know it's 95 miles to the closest sewer line from here. <laughs> well, they had been discussing whether or not to put bathrooms inside the church. <laughs> and he said, besides that, we've never had bathrooms in this church and we don't need them now. <laughs> well, while the discussion was going on, this young man came up and introduced himself. He had gotten stuck there, his car had broken down. And he had waited three days for the bus to arrive with his car parked. And was spending the night over the local tavern in a room. And, uh, and uh, I said, where are you from? And he said, Cleveland, Ohio. And I said, do you go to church in Cleveland? And he named the church. I did not know it. But I knew it was probably larger than the church we were sitting at. And... and <clears throat> As they discussed, I said to the gentleman, I said, I wouldn't worry about that because when you build your Christian life center, you'll be able to put them in it. <laughs> the young man got so tickled. The other two looked at me like I'd lost my mind. And we did the service and started down the road towards Washington State. And uh, I said, it doesn't matter, does it? It doesn't matter whether you're in a large church or a small church, or it doesn't matter. There's always conflict in a church over something. Uh, I don't even know that it matters that uh, you're all related. <laughs> now, now, maybe uh, it makes a difference if you're related to most of the people in the congregation because you kind of have to get along with your family, you know. Uh, I had a uh, young man who uh, grew up in the Clover Church, went to seminary, and is now uh, a mission co-worker on the board uh, outside of Douglas, Arizona, between Douglas and Aqua Puerta, uh, Mexico. He called me the other day, as a matter of fact, just to check in. Uh, and, uh, and, and, he said to me one time, because I would always start my newsletter article, Dear Friends. He said, I wish you wouldn't do that. And I said, why? He said, I wish you would say, Dear Brothers and Sisters. And I said, why, Mark? He said, because Bill, you get to pick your friends, but you don't get to pick your brothers and sisters. <laughs> You're stuck with them. <laughs> And that's true of the church, and that's what this passage is getting at. You don't 
get to choose the people you sit in church with. Those are the people you're stuck with. And we're called to love one another regardless of whether we agree on everything or not. Or whether we even think alike. We're called to love one another. In the Apostles' Creed that we'll say in a few minutes, I'm sorry, in the Lord's, in the Lord's Prayer that we'll say in a few minutes, we have the lines, forgive us our debts, and really the way it should be translated, I've told you all this. As we forgive those who hold debts against us. If you go into a court of law, a bankruptcy court, uh, the bailiff comes out and says, all of the debtors, please rise. And then he swears you in together. All the people who have a case before the court. And it's bankruptcy court, so everybody who comes in there is a debtor. Uh, they're, they're in trouble financially. And it doesn't matter whether you're rich or the CEO of a large corporation that's declaring chapter 13, you're all there in one pool together. Every one of you are debtors. It's like walking into church and I, somebody says, well, all the sinners please stand up. Well, you know, Unless you're lying, everybody stands up. You know, everybody has to stand up because all of us have come short of the glory of God. All of us have failed to live up to what God has called us. We miss the mark in some way. That's what sin is, is to miss the mark. Somewhere we miss the mark. We didn't quite make it. There's a great story of a young boy, a nine-year-old. And it must have been either in a Lutheran church or a Catholic church or an Episcopal church. But he had served that Sunday as the cupbearer. Now the cupbearer comes in bearing the cup, just like you would have the person coming in bringing the crucifix, the crucifer, or... <coughs> bringing the bread or bringing the Bible, the beaver, uh, or bringing the light, you know, the person who comes in with the light and lights the candles on the altar. And, uh, which I never understood why they didn't use the Latin for that. Instead of calling him the light bearer, they didn't call him the Lucifer. But anyway, that's... that's uh, but this young boy had been the cupbearer. After the service, his mother, actually his um, foster mother, came back to the priest and said, I think we messed up. He said, what are you talking about? He said, well, my son, she called him his son, my son was the cupbearer today. And he said, oh, he didn't want to be the cupbearer? Oh, yeah, he wanted to be the cupbearer, but he hadn't been baptized. And I'm just wondering if that means anybody who took from the cup didn't really get the blood of Christ. And he, he assured her that it was okay that he hadn't been baptized. It would be all right. And then she said, can he be baptized? And he said, well, Sure, why would you think he couldn't be baptized? She said, well, after we were leaving, he said to me, I haven't been baptized, and I'd like to get baptized. She said, but I know that his mother had been an atheist. She wasn't much in religion. And she was a drug addict and actually died from an overdose. And so he just never went to church and was never baptized until I took him in and I started bringing him to church. And he wants to know if he can be baptized. He said, well, certainly he can be baptized. If you present him for baptism, if you, he's under your care, he can be baptized. Well, he had a question. He said, what was the question? He said, can you be baptized if you hate somebody? 
he said, well, who does he hate? And she said, well, he said he hates his mommy because she left him and never took care of him. And he just wondered, can I be baptized if I hate my mommy? And the priest said, what did you say to him? She said, well, I think if you get baptized, the waters will help with the healing. And he said, good answer. What a great answer that is. If you get baptized, the water will help with the healing. And that's what the sacraments do. They help us with our healing. It's not that we never have conflicts in a church or that we never struggle as congregations or presbyteries or synods. Uh, one and I are headed to the synod meeting. It's not that conflicts don't arise, but that beyond the conflict, our commonality is we are the baptized of Christ. We are the baptized of Christ. We have been marked and sealed in the faith. And our desire then is to find ways to live with each other in community. After all, that's what the word congregation means. We are the community of faith. And though we may struggle sometimes, though we may want to get it better than we do, we're still the community of faith. We're the people of God in this place. And God has called us to be God's own people, to live as brothers and sisters in the faith, and to continue the good work of Christ in building the kingdom. May it be so for us. Father, we ask that you would bless us in the reading and the hearing of the word, so that we might be inspired to be your holy people in the world. For it's in the name of Christ we ask it. Amen. The Apostles' Creed is on the sheet uh, in front of you if you need it. Some words before you. Christian, what is it you believe? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and is seated on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of the saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
uh, as the Hurricane Lee comes across the ocean. And to all of those who are recovering from disasters, who have personal problems, who are struggling with illness, are there those that you would mention? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we do pray for those who have been so devastated by this earthquake. We ask that you would bless them as they continue to dig out, to find those that they have cared about, to try to release those who are trapped, to save the lives of those who can still be saved. And Father, we pray for those who have been in the path of the hurricanes, who watch it as it approaches, who are even now digging out and mucking out, from the devastation of the last hurricane. We pray for the people across this nation who have suffered from floods and wildfires and other disasters. We ask that you will make us responsible in the way we act and what we do so that the devastation of the changing climate whatever part we have in there, that we might take that responsibility and do something about it. And Father, we ask that you would continue to bless the people of Ukraine and Russia, to be with the people of North Korea and China as they decide who their allies will be. We ask God that you will guard us against conflict it is useless and has no part in the work of your kingdom. Bless those mothers and fathers who are receiving their sons and daughters back dead. Bless them as they sort through and go through the process of grief. This is hard times. We pray for Mark Adams and for those on our southern board as they do the hard work of being welcome agents, representing Christ on our behalf to those who are fleeing unimaginable circumstances. We ask that you would bless them in their work. And then, Father, we ask that you would bless us, that we might continue to be the people you are calling us to be, to that end, we pray the words that you have taught us as disciples that we should pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For that is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our, our, um, we now celebrate with the giving of our gifts.
Amen. Our hymn is on the insert that was in your bulletin. God's mercy upon you.